Welcome to South London. This is the final word. Adam Cohen's Jeff Lemon and the great Mark Steele, who has a, a, a glass of rum in his hand. He's got mm. a cup of coffee next to him, wearing Crystal Palace. Um, we were meant to be doing this interview last week, but you're taking French lessons at the moment, which I thought was quite funny, given you've like literally written a book about the French Revolution. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to sort of, I have to be quite diligent about keep doing the French. I've done a show, I've done some shows in French now. Oh, right. uh, uh, but, well, do you know what? Language, it's like, it's like sport. It's uh, so many things is that every time you think that you've, you've cracked it, you then come across the fact that you really haven't. <laughs> and it's a bit like, um, so, you know, I've done shows now that go down the radio on French. So you could think, Oh right, I, I can speak French now. Then I can speak French for hours with people, but I'm still miles away from being fluent. Miles right. away from sort of genuinely being like a French person. Miles away, and I often think, you know, when when you play amateur sport such as cricket, I mean, this isn't just a, a random segue. You sort of work so hard to sometimes to become a little bit better, and you think, "Oh, imagine being that good." But really, amateur sport, and even at some levels, professional sport, you're really just battling away to be a different level of shit. <laughs> and, <laughs> and like the one sport I can play at all properly is table tennis. I'm not bad at it because we used to play. No, like, brilliant story, really. I was brought up in a place about 20 miles from here called Swanley in uh, Kent. And it's, was, it had nothing. There was nothing there for kids to do. It was unbelievable that there were any cars at all that were left not turned over upside down and burnt or any birds not shot out of the tree <laughs> with an air rifle. And this bloke called Mr. McDonald, one day, aware of this, he was a good table tennis player. He set up a table tennis club. And about 100 kids went to it immediately because it was something to do. And I got sort of uber competitive, of course, of my nature, I suppose, and uh, uh, and tried to be as good as I could. And I've played ever since in leagues and stuff like that. And I could beat most people, for sure, who haven't played. But then you come up against a really good player mm. and I realise I'm fucking useless <laughs> useless and um and that's quite sobering in a way mm. and i think that must be like that imagine how good you would have to be to be a county cricketer the best of everyone at the school you go off to your sort of clubs you're you're the best of all of them at 15, you're playing in the first team and you're regularly creaming 50s and 60s. You're that good. Mm. And you are so good. You keep up with that. You keep fit. You don't have anything going wrong. You end up being good enough to play for North Ants. And then Dale Steen comes in and bowls and you think, I ain't got a fucking clue what to do with this. <laughs> I saw uh, Chris Smalling is playing. He's playing in footy in Italy now, isn't he? He, he, he did his post-match press conference last night in Italian. Like he's sort of wow. an emblem of him really embracing the local culture and right. that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, there's been some criticism of it that it's not spoken as fluently as it otherwise might. But what you're describing there about second and third and subsequent languages, we, we probably do take it for granted when people come to live in countries like Australia or England and mm. English is, a, you know, obviously not their native tongue. And we just expect that they'll be fine with it. Um, you know, we, we never really take into consideration. Are, are Australians as bad as English at learning yeah, other languages? Yeah, I, I think we are. By that I mean if we, we don't anticipate that someone won't be able to speak right. English. In Asia, for example, if, if someone who's a student in Australia had come to Melbourne, whatever it is, we would yeah, just yeah, expect yeah. that they yeah. are good enough to be conversant with us, not the other way around. Yeah. I mean, I would say, you know, if three, if three blokes, if three English blokes go to Paris for the weekend and at some point one of them says to one French person, merci beaucoup, <laughs> the others will go, oi, look at him. <laughs> hey, listen to Charles de Gaulle here. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I've been doing a bit of it. Uh, it actually does work in the French shows. It's about e an English person, even if they learn French, which they probably won't, but even if they do, we'll go, I've learned the words. I'm not bloody learning the accent at all. So th uh, they're from the East End. They'll go, mm. Je m'appelle Elf. Je a wish damn. 
they're not going to learn. And I did, there is a, a, an Irish bar by a, a canal in the, uh, just the north bit of Paris. And um, the barman there, he was from Belfast. He's quite a tricky dude. Let's see if I can do it right. Uh, I heard him saying to someone, Jabber de EC, Pandan van Sankan. French in a Northern Ireland accent. Right. And uh, so he's just, I'm not bothering to learn the French accent. <laughs> J'ai appris des mots. C'est suffisant. Suffis, suffis so, yeah. So they're just, um, yeah, we won't bother learning the I think part of it's confidence thing. English people are quite, you know, so shy and they feel sort of stupid about, you know, so they will go. So even bonjour, bonjour. No, you have to do it. Bonjour. They do speak like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, um, but yeah, and then there's st- you're still miles away, even when you've put in all of this effort. There's something very reassuring about that. You're never going to get to the end. You'd never get there. You know, you were. I could learn French for the rest of my life, ten lessons a day. I still there would still be loads more to get. You know, at, at the end of it, you don't manage it and I think you know, sport is really like that isn't it I mean mm. what must be you know I sometimes read Gary Lineker on social media talking about Messi and I love the sheer love he has for yeah, Messi yeah. like this is someone boy like isn't it yeah mm. I can't these things you do I can't imagine one of England's greatest ever strikers but he's got he can't imagine being that good and um yeah, so I don't know. That's what I like. I most most things I think have a sporting analogy, a sporting reflection, uh, and I know my missus often laughs because I'll sort of you know I'll go, oh, it's a bit like you know in a game of rugby or something, and I always find a sporting analogy. Mm. But I think there are, I think there is one for most things. That kind of progression, that's something that uh, Nick Hornby wrote about in Fever Pitch as well. The, the, yes. the football player who's the best football player that you know. And I think we all have that experience in our local club land or whatever. There's there's a local player, everybody gets invested. Oh, you should see this guy absolutely tailed up, you know, Doncaster last time they came together. And then mm. that guy's never going to make it. That guy never gets anywhere near a draft or a, or a first no. state 11 or whatever it is. And, and, and you have the same thing with the, the kind of players who dominate first grade cricket and then go up to state cricket and they're, they're nobody and they, they drop away in the, after a couple of matches. It's, it is fascinating just how much you just start again once you level up. Yes. And I wonder how much you have to enjoy being that good. I suppose you have to get it, you have to get it into your head that this is this is a lovely thing to be this good and see that as a great achievement. Um I'm you know, I'm very pleased that neither of my kids were good at you know they're good at sport enough to enjoy it. You know my lad in there he was a decent goalkeeper but he always wanted to play in teams that were a bit of a laugh. Um he was not you know quite a decent wicketkeeper and bowler but no, I want to play in a team that's a laugh. So we played in our local team that was full of like, you know, brilliant characters and stuff. And he really loved that. He didn't want to play in a team that took it too seriously. Mm. But it's the balance has to be right, doesn't it, with a sport? So with, with cricket, if someone's absolutely hopeless, it just destroys, you know, especially when you've given up six hours to play this bloody game. Mm. And then, oh, and then we had a captain, wonderful bloke, but was too nice and someone had come along Well, we've got to give him an over and he'd go for 28 and the whole bloody game's ruined now. It's part of the joy of being, or, or part of the art rather, of being a social captain, isn't it? By, yeah. you know, you're kind of pushing and pulling off the lever with, with ordinary players against dreadful players against good players on yeah. a Sunday game, for example, in an yeah. effort to try and get it to the final over. <laughs> Acknowledging there'll be that guy who'll go for 28 if bold. Like, that, that, that's, that's not yeah. an easy balance. I think that, see, I wouldn't, I never, I was captain for a while and I wouldn't get, but, what he would do, he would then give him another over, right? And then I would think, oh, God. he was, he was, oh God, no, no. So now all our days are ruined, and I, <laughs> well, you just sort of clamber over fences and into farms looking for the ball. 
So we've had an early, <laughs> early digression here, but let's just set this up, shall we? You've got cricket everywhere we look in this house of yours. I mean, I can see a picture of WG Grace in the corner. Yeah. I can see Brett Lee and Andy Flintoff from the 2005 yeah, Ashes at well, Edgbaston. Yeah, one of the great moments a, of sport A ever. picture of Ben Stokes winning the Headingley Miracle in, in 2019. Yeah. When you picked me up from the station, we went past Selhurst, Selhurst uh, Park where you've spent... I'm tipping an inordinate amount of your life watching Crystal Palace yeah, 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 win yeah. and lose, promoted, relegated, all the rest of it. Yeah, I mean, is yeah. that still like a major part of your life is riding the the ebb and flow of being a, a football supporter? I mean, the fact that Palace beat Leeds yesterday, right? You would have gone to bed a happy man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, uh I, yeah, there's something that's so beautiful. And when sort of, I mean, for example, during during the lockdown, I always got a little bit frustrated when, for good reason, you know, you would get sports people on the radio or the telly and they would say, well, when something like COVID happens, it gets into perspective. Sport is only a game and so on. There's more important things. And I would think, I don't think that's the right way of putting it. I mean, there is a reason why it's important that people live through a pandemic and don't die. And that is so that they can enjoy life. And without something like sport or things that seem frivolous music i mean if you took away all those things you might as well bloody die of, in a icu unit might you i do it's just sort of uh, it, they they are the reasons why why we want to exist aren't they i just you know i don't so um i don't think it's that frivolous and i think also sport is a reflection of the rest of of life it doesn't exist separate Separate from that, when you meet someone who is an angry supporter of a very top football club, that person's at you know, they, and they are, you go admit that we're the best of you get them on the phone ins. They're yes. brilliant people on the football <laughs> phone ins on a Saturday. You've got to admit that Manchester United, right, that, that we ought to be top of the re- and, uh, right now, your anger, mate, that's not. Because you drew with Leicester, there is something else in your life sure. that's really gone badly wrong here <laughs> that means you're that angry and that you have to support a team that's top, otherwise you can't somehow make And it's so much, I mean, it's you know, such a cliche, but football clubs, I think still are, they still are very much part of the community. Mm. Uh, if they're not, then they, they don't really, no, it's, it's interesting, Paris Saint-Germain have spent more money than any football club in history on buying all the top players, Messi, Neymar, what have you, Mbappé. And people in Paris don't identify with them. It doesn't mean anything. To, to people much you don't see people walk around Paris with the shirts they don't care it's not they're, they're distant from it yeah right and um, so what's the point in that and I'm sure that's part of the reason that they've not they've not won the European Cup even though they've got the best players in the world they don't win these things I think that that it, it, it's it's got to represent something else other than that you know Federer someone like Federer is so loved he's not just loved because he wins I mean I can't don't always go along with this but when the the absolute adoration of the man he represents something that is way beyond his ability I think Mm. you know the the balletic way he plays and so on or if you take it to its absolute extreme someone like Usain Bolt uh, wasn't he, he, he was his impact was way beyond the impact of someone who's been the fastest man in the history of the planet to run 100 metres. He I, he came here to Crystal Palace. He came to the the stadium. He'd, I think it was just after or just before he won, he broke the world record in Berlin. And uh, there was the, the Athletic Stadium was one of the main stadiums here. It, uh, no, it must have been before because it was... Uh, because it sort of went down the toilet after the uh, Olympic Stadium was built in East London. But he came to Crystal Palace and it was packed up there. I went up there, took my son up there. I said, oh, you you know, when you're old, you're going to say I was able to see Bolt. He was, my lad was about 10 at the time, I think. And, uh, and at the bottom there, you could just see this figure come out, emerge. There he was. And the crowd must have been probably, I guess, three quarters Jamaican. And I've never, ever seen any crowd go so bonkers for someone. It, it, what he represented was way more than... A, I don't know. I don't know. You'd have to sort of... Uh, uh, it'd be very trite to try and work out what it would. But it, it meant everything. 
independence, nationalism, mm. whatever. A mm. million things is what he is what he represented for people. And cricket's definitely done that. I mean, the whole history of cricket, because it's so bound up with empire, um, including in Australia. I mean, it's, it's body line, for example. Oh, can we talk about that? We absolutely can. Right. A topic that we talk about probably too often on the podcast, but um, any new perspectives, welcome. Well, the body line series... I think is uh, uh, for people who don't know. I guess most people listen to this. If they're listening to this, they'd have a pretty good handle yeah. on 32, 33. So <laughs> there are so many fascinating aspects to it. So in the 1930s, the British team, captained by a man called Douglas Jardine, who was very public, it was as public school as it could possibly be, uh, they devised this way of bowling, which was to bowl the ball short and at the batsman's body and so on, in particular to stop Don Bradman, who was the... Uh, had a bigger impact than any other batter in the history of cricket and it largely worked and this was seen as appalling and so on and the Australian government was, became involved and there was a huge diplomatic incident and it's often portrayed as about cricket and was it really cricket was it bending the rules was it immoral and so on but that's it seems to me is just to miss out everything that created that because this was the 1930s, a recession had taken place, a proper recession, not like the bloody modern recessions. Proper recession, a quarter of Australia unemployed, that sort of thing, was it? So a quarter of New South Wales unemployed, I believe, in the 30s at one point. Yeah, and they were calling in their debts as well. The, the British government were, were insisting on loan yes. repayments that at the time were, were proving punitive and... Thus, the interest rate went through the roof, and the extended unemployment from the yes, from the depression that without well, a depression, not just recession. By that yeah, point, yeah, 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 exactly. People's lives absolutely torn apart. There was about, I think his name was Sir Otto Niemeyer. Yeah, I don't remember it. this, yep. right? So he was the head of the bank, his central bank, I think. Yeah, right. Yeah. So he announced that the Australians had been living in the lap of luxury, and that was why it was time that they had to start paying up their debts. Mm. So I was imagine if you're been you know, one of the miners or so on, and who's lost his job or a family very much you know like we see today you know the uh, oh, we've got to cut benefits and so on because that's where all the money's been going as uh, that sort of thing and so this the, the hostility towards the british government in australia must have been absolutely immense and then at that point i'm trying to remember this from well because i did write a thing about this so jack lang was this radical politician in australia who stood to be governor of New South Wales. Premier of New South Wales, yeah. Right. And he was deposed by the British imperial government. You cannot do that. No, nope, he's too radical. We're not going to allow him to be the candidate. And that was a few months before the Bodyline series. To suggest that that didn't have an impact <laughs> on the attitude towards the British team is would be ridiculous. But it wasn't only that, because Douglas Jardim was seen as the absolute embodiment of the British establishment. And I think it's really interesting that Harold Larwood, who was the fast bowler who was primarily sort of involved in bowling, this sort of bowling that uh, injured some of the Australian batters, the hostility was never really towards Larwood. And indeed, Larwood went out and lived out in Australia for for the rest of his life, eventually. Um it was towards the British establishment and in particular Jardin, who wore a cravat and all that and played up the sort of uh, um, the snobbery towards Australia and so on. So to remove that from from that, you know, as CLR James famously at the start of his book, uh, famous cricket book, Beyond a Boundary, it starts, what does he know of cricket who only cricket knows? And you can apply that to anything, I think. You know, if you don't see the overall context, you can't even make sense of the thing that you're supposed to be an expert on. And that, it seems to me, is a really, really good example of it. The body, like, this was an amazing story about empire and class. And if you try to remove that from the story, you can't begin to make mm. sense of it. You're talking about sport in the grand sweeping ways, you know, the, the inspiration, the 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 national representation all all of those kinds of things to me it seems very self evident that cricket is funny um, and that for me cricket is funny in a way that other sports are not it, it hits a different level from a professional comedian's perspective as well as a historian is cricket funny 
Well, I think everything's funny, but I think you're right. Cricket is... I wonder... I don't know why. Maybe it's the length of time that you're sat around, but that makes it absolutely hysterically... Fu- the characters that... I suppose it's a bit like a reality telly show. You know, if someone's in one of these big brother houses, they can't hide their real personality because after five days, you know, the, the real them comes out. And it's almost like that with with a cricket team. So I've played in cricket teams where... Oh, I don't know. There's so many, but look, there was a guy. There was a guy we play. We had in our team called called Ian, uh, who was a he played the trumpet in the in an orchestra, <laughs> and he was about five foot two, and he was incredibly. He would speak with this incredibly military sort of voice, and uh, he would bat in a classic 1920s fashion. He was sort of just clink and defend everything and in a 40 over game and he and then we sent him into open once and I used to open so I was opening with him and he was four not out after 10 overs and just like play. and then he would, we would meet up we would meet up in the middle after each over and he would say well the main thing is not to do anything stupid and I found this immensely funny and I said to him once Ian do something stupid. <laughs> they're going mentally. They're going, fucking get out. If you can't get any runs, get out. And these guys, well, the main thing is, let's see if we can see these two off. You go, yeah. And then there's, we're nearly halfway through the inning. And, um, <laughs> and then we also had an umpire bloke who was he, he was about eighty odd by by this time. He could obviously could play anymore, so he used to he umpired. He was from Halifax, Ken, and he uh, and he'd been a prison guard. <laughs> Kenny was from Halifax, and he used to. Uh, uh, this is true. He used to sit there at the edge, and he'd be reading the papers, and he'd go, "Oh, look at the bloody immigrants! The number of them coming over now. We got. We can't carry on like this. We we got to put a stop to this and start sending them back." He'd say. But his wife was from Indonesia, and he loved this cricket club. Two thirds of which were from like. Pakistan or India or Bangladesh. He was really, really big mates with a bloke called Bill Al from Bangladesh. He was our spinner and they used to share fags and that. So you go, we've got to start <laughs> setting up. But this used to happen about once every three weeks. You go, oh, okay, Ken, yeah, send them back. That's a good idea. I mean, we've got to have to, yeah. Yeah. So we'll start with your wife. What? She's not an immigrant. Oh, well, she, where's she from? Indonesia. What's that, that in Croydon, is it, Ken? <laughs> And Bill Al, he'd have to go. <laughs> Not Bill Al. And I, <laughs> so you say to him, all right, so the rule is you have you get sent back but not if you took two for 24 last Sunday. Is that the rule? <laughs> oh, and then he'd go, <laughs> and then he'd go, oh, you've got me again with your fancy arguments. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so one day, right, one day we were down in a, playing this club in Sussex and Ian's batting. And he's gone right forward, ridiculously, for about eight foot forward. Clink with this forward defensive. Missed it, and it's at his pad. And Ken's given him out. And I, I swear, if someone had filmed the next two minutes, it would get a million hits on YouTube. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's come off. It was sort of, I think it was the the interval, right? And Ian's gone up, gone up to him and gone, Kenneth, it is quite clear and evident to anybody whose perception was in any way working, whose faculties had in the slightest sense anything functioning that I could in no way be given out under those circumstances. And I, it was the biggest rage. And Ken just went, well, I'll just see it as I, as, I, as I saw it. Well, it's not good enough. There is simply no purpose in pursuing this bloody game if we are going to officiate in such a pathetic manner. And I... Fuck, about 15 people were laying on the floor just crying. Just please stop. It's so funny. I just sort of... I, I, you, if you'd written it that that way, it would look too contrived. <laughs> As, <laughs> there was... Um, oh, there was a game. Because lad, my, my lad's in, in there. Was, oh, was I captain? I think I was captain. And we were... Oh, let me see if I can get this right. So... <laughs> uh, we were playing a rival team and they were really, really rude and they they thrashed us and they wanted one to win. They had about five wickets left 
And this bloke was on 70 or 80. He was so arrogant. And he was at the non-striker's end. And he shouted down to his mate. He said, no, no, no. Don't, no, don't get a run. Don't get a run because... Uh, don't get a run because I want to hit the winning run against these wankers like that, you know. So a couple of our players, younger players, started having a go at their players. There's a bit of pushing and shoving and I'm captain. I'm going, oh, boy, stop this, you know, and all that. And then we had a, a young lad who was uh, who was running in bowling and then he started shouting as he's running in, wankers they are. So we had to stop again. He's 16 and you're <laughs> shouting at him while he's running in. Oh, fuck, he's so oh, it's horrible, horrible. And it all calmed down, right? All right, we all calmed down. We all, I did my United Nations bit. Come on, boys, this is no good. Right? All calmed down. We all agreed, shook hands, calmed down. We carry on with what's left of the game. And then this lad come in and bowled it. And the player knocked it up in the air and got caught. <laughs> and the bloke, as he caught it, went, Yeah, now fuck off, you twat! <laughs> and it all kicked off again. <laughs> Cricket <laughs> over cricket. <laughs> if, if, if there's something I, I think there's something that I've, I've realised recently. Like I haven't played an awful lot in the last five years, mostly through injury, but also I've, I've not sort of made time for it. Like there's always a game of cricket if you want, if you're willing to make time for it. I mean, you've played forever. I, I mean, I think most people who know of your story know you were kicked out of school for going to a cricket camp. Yeah, and yeah, a kid yeah, that, yeah, yeah. But I mean, maybe not the end of the story. Where you've continued to play, you know into your 60s, literally. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that I reckon some people are, are too quick to dismiss the importance of still playing the game to still not only have that communal experience you're discussing, but to still understand how it works and not sort of lose touch with it. Like, do you think that's been a big part of your love of the game has been that you still strap the white, you know, put the whites on or strap yeah, the pads on I through the summer? Yeah, I, well, I think most people, most, most people, uh, most people love, most people's ambition is to be good at the thing they're not good at, isn't mm. it? <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm amazed at sort of the number. I, every now and again, I'll meet someone who's like amazing in some field or other, a brilliant actor or a brilliant singer or something, and they are they want to be a stand up. Loads of musicians, <laughs> and I've I've seen someone play a stadium and that, and they want to be a they what they really want to be is a stand up. I was talking to uh, Neil Hannon from the Divine Comedy. It's what he wants to be. A stand-up, probably the other thing he'd want to be is a cricketer. Quite possibly, given his yeah. other band. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, uh, uh, yeah, and I, I, I speak to sports people. I, you know, I've met a number of cricketers, footballers and stuff, and I'm absolutely in awe of them being that good at something. And to them, it's just, yeah, it's just, a, just another thing. Yeah. I was talk I talked to one... Uh, a guy who played for Nottingham Forest, and he went, "Oh yeah, always, yeah, always." No, he, he was he was a, played in the champ, played for Hull, and he went, "Yeah, I always used to score at Nottingham Forest. It was lucky for me." And I thought, "Oh, you said that's probably in the same way that I might go." Oh yeah, I always uh, I always have a good gig in Sheffield or something like that. You mm. know? But to me, I'm thinking, you can't just casually just dismiss that. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I always do well at Nottingham Knock him Forest. Knock in fun at Forest. <laughs> Incredible, isn't it? But I suppose you just get, I suppose you just get get used to. It. I've got to tell you, this was I don't know. I told you this before. I don't, I don't remember. This was one we were playing this team in uh, called Ottershaw, out on West sort of on the M25 out by West London, uh, and we, we'd done well against them the last couple of times. And I was I was out. And there was this umpire, they had this umpire, and he was right grumpy, this bloke. He just had this scowl on his face, probably about late 60s. Absolutely scowling, horrible, grumpy bloke. Don't know what was wrong with him. And I was out, and I came off, and I, I was sort of taking my pads off. And the next ball, uh, our, our player just did this straight drive, really walloped it, and it went straight into this grumpy umpire's shin, <laughs> absolutely straight into it, and you heard it click, oh! and he's gone clattered down, and the sort of two people have helped him up, and he, they've obbled him off, and he's like that, someone else had to go and take his place, and he sat next to me, and he's put his foot up on the table, rolled up his trousers, already there was a ball-sized lump on his leg. With the seam, you could see it on his yes. lump. He, oh, and it hurt. And he was howling and wailing. And I thought, well, we better 
do something. So I went in the clubhouse. They've got a nice clubhouse there. And there was a woman there who was sort of getting the sandwiches and stuff. And she was behind the bar. And I said, um, have you got some ice, please? And she just completely ignored me and carried on, like, cleaning glasses and stuff. And you could hear out, just right outside, oh, my leg! I said, excuse me, can I have some, have you got some ice there? There's a bloke to put on the bloke's leg. Some ice? And then she went, I ain't got any. She carried on. <laughs> and I said, oh, right, there's an ice bucket there. I can see that's got ice in it. No, nah, I don't think so. I said, yeah, Annette. And after about five minutes of this, she was, she picked up the ice bucket and she it was full of ice and she put it some in a towel and she gave it to me and she went, he's my ex-husband. I've no fucking sympathy. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, this is your relationship with cricket now. How how does that kick off? Because it's interesting, like cricket as a kind of contested site in England where elitism has dominated the way that the sports run. That's very antithetical to your sort of approach to, to the world and to politics and so on. How does cricket get you in the first place? I, I don't know. I mean, this is sort of... Um, in a way, you'd have to sort of go you'd have to go into a sort of nature or nurture debate, really, as to why it is that some people, why it appeals to some people, the same way that music, you know, there are sort of, uh, I'm someone who, from the age of about four, I knew that certain music sort of spoke to me, in, if you like, in a certain way, and I've always collected records and so on since then, and some people, it just doesn't have that impact, and they're not wrong, it just doesn't, and, I, and cricket, I don't know why something about it that just mesmerises people, um, with other people, it's fishing, and you know, they must have the per sort of personality or something, whether it's innate or whether it's their upbringing, I don't know, but to me, I, I could see the appeal of fishing, but I don't think it's anything I would ever do, but... Uh, I do think this, that, uh, uh, this is something that I think does matter, is that quite if you put anything on social media, for example, about something, oh, an amazing bit of cricket or something, you will get various people who tell you cricket is boring. And I think that that is something way beyond sport, the problem with that. Because if you think something is boring, that is an incredibly patronising and condescending way to look at humanity, it's not that it is boring, it's you don't get it. So in the same way that, I don't know, I, I, I like say with the fishing thing, if I was to say, you're wrong, if you go fishing all night, you're wrong, it's boring, can't you see? <laughs> That's stupid, it's, I, it doesn't appeal to me. And I, or insurance, if someone's fascinated with insurance, that's great, you know. I'm sure there's loads of amazingly interesting things about it, but um, it doesn't particularly appeal to me. And I think that you're you're someone that's really you've got a problem in all sorts of areas if you're willing to write off things that people enjoy as boring. Having said that, I don't. If you're cricket, I have found always found it absolutely mesmerising. Um, if I'm driving. And there's a cricket match on. I I stop the car and watch two or three balls of it. Right. If, it's quite relatable, isn't it? I, I feel the same way. If I see, I mean, yeah, if I go past, I, I feel like I'm duty bound to stop and watch a ball or two. Do you so, commentate on it? Well, no, but what I have detected though, you've met my young daughter Winnie and she will go, how's that? Like she, cause she, you know. How old is she? Two and a half, but because I've done that with her as a piss take when we've gone past local cricket Brilliant. games, that she will now do that um, reflexively. But yeah, I, I feel that's quite, you know, quite a thing. It's interesting like cricket and politics and the intersection between the two. Like, cause cricket is considered to be, and I'm being unfair here in a way, but I'll say it anyway. It's considered to be a right wing sport, isn't it? Like it's considered to be a sport that is that's of the establishment partly due to what you were describing before, British colony sport and so on. Yet, you obviously aren't of that political tradition whatsoever, but you've been compelled by cricket all the way through. I mean, even with your politics, right, you're 
basically the perfect age to be all about, um, oh, I say all about like it's a, a, a virtuous thing, but you, you wanted to go after the Thatcher government back in the in the late 70s, yeah, early yeah. 80s. Like you fit into that slipstream where you were like fighting the National Front and, you know, you were, that's your background, that's your existence. But alongside that, you're interested in this quaint game of cricket where a lot of people would probably abhor your political views. Yeah, but I don't... As, well, I mean, I'm sure you'd agree with this, Adam, but a, a, a sport can't be right-wing, can it? I mean, the, uh, the even golf, you know, it can't actually be right-wing to get pleasure out of hitting a ball in a certain way. What is right-wing is the people that come to dominate and officiate Yeah, the, the perception of the people that run it, I guess, is what I'm yeah. trying to get at. And we get that. So I would think you know. two, I would say two things about that. First of all, outside of England, that would seem absurd. That yeah, that's a very right British wing. thing to say. You know, it? in Australia, you know, the, the to say that it was a sort of middle-class sport when you're on the, the hill in Sydney would seem a very strange thing, wouldn't it? To say it's a middle-class sure. sport in Mumbai or in... Uh, uh, you know, I don't know, or to just well, you, you you'll have watched cricket in the Caribbean. To say it's a middle class sport, it, you know, I know it's I know the crowds have diminished greatly there now, but uh, it, uh, up until the nineteen nineties would have been absolutely ab absurd. And in fact, more than that, not only was it not a middle class sport, it was actually the sport of rebellion in. So, for example, we talked about body line. In Australia, it was the sport of rebellion, of proving that we are we are a nation that is quite capable of being independent of Britain. We don't need your patronage. And I mean, uh, Trevor McDonald wrote a book about uh, about West Indies cricket, uh, in which he just started the started the book by saying, quite simply, in the nineteen fifties, when the West Indies beat England at cricket uh, with Ramadan and Valentine, the spinners. Mm -hmm. There was a, a sense amongst the Caribbean that if we can beat them at their sport, surely we can govern ourselves without their help. Now, you know, that might be to simplify it a bit, but it certainly had an impact. I think it's unquestionable that it had an impact. And it was a sport played by people who... So, I mean, Viv Richards, after all, is an intensely political person and saw the uh, and saw the West Indies team of the, the late 70s and early 80s as being a team that was pursuing a political campaign, if you like. You know, so that was very, very much against the empire and against the establishment. So I don't think a sport can be either left-wing or right-wing. A bit like religion, it can be, it can take on the, the, the shape of whoever it is that that is in charge. No, of yeah, it, I, like. you're right. I, I've, I've framed that incorrectly. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that like in those formative years for you politically, when you're very involved and, you know, that's your political awakening, I suppose, as a, a teenager and, and uh, it's such a such a, uh, a, a, a time in British history, contested space, that that's when you're presumably still playing cricket, heading along to watch test cricket. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, I mean, you know, I those two things are happening side by side for you. It never occurred to me that it was a sort of middle class sport, really. I mean, I, or that it was quite the opposite. I mean, a lot of, I've talked about Swanley where I was brought up. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the really hard kids, I was never one of them. You know, I've always been the most useless, pathetic, you know, I can't, fight or do any of them right oh, I, was never, yeah, I was always too weedy for any of that but the kids who were like that from the rougher states and that they would play we used to have these test matches on the um you know, we'd have a, like a 40 over match we'd set up ourselves we managed to sort of cobble enough equipment and that and have it on a big field um in Swanley we used to play six or seven of them matches in a in a summer holiday and I'm sure that those are the only days that no cars were nicked in Swanley you know because <laughs> the, the the kids who were doing that were playing cricket. It never occurred to me that it wasn't um, that it wasn't a sport for the likes of us. And then, as of course, as you join a club or anything, then you realise, oh, there are all of these obstacles. And I don't think that the people who run the cricket clubs, who very often are not so much right, I don't mind right wing, but they're sort of they're very they'd be very snobbish. They they run the club in their own in their own image. You know, they mm. they. You're going to attract the the sort of people. You're going to be comfortable with the sort of people who are. They, when I joined a club, they were salesmen and they were sort of people who were, 
you know, quite wealthy and so on in the area, and I felt very much out of place. And I don't think it was that they were being rude or unpleasant at all. I think that they just couldn't see that someone from my background felt out of place, you know. And it's a bit like when, when, with, with the sort of racism or, or the fact that Asian people aren't don't feel comfortable in certain uh, environments. It's not necessary. Sometimes it's out and out racism, but I suspect most of the time it's not. It's just that these people have never. It's never occurred to them to try and welcome people from another background. It's never occurred to them to to do the sort of things that might mean that a working class kid whose parents are, are from Pakistan. You know, to welcome them into this environment, you're going to need to make a little bit of an effort to make it comfortable for them. So I think that that's a lot of the same with tennis clubs and golf clubs and so on. I suspect, um, you know, that I, I suspect that's 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 the case really. And then the final thing I would say about that is that I think if there's a sort of um, I don't know, a sort of an attitude that the left ought to take really over these sorts of things. The last thing should be would be to agree with the the most snobbish people in the sport and say, yes, the sport itself is snobbish and boring and therefore you can have it. Quite the opposite. I think that it should be a demand that this should be available for everybody. I mean, there's some brilliant campaigns in Britain over tennis, for example, at the mm. moment to make tennis accessible for people from working class backgrounds and so on. Not least of which, because you know, Andy Murray and Judy Murray are very much of that opinion. And so they, um, you'd want to get behind that, wouldn't you? And go, yeah, it should be accessible for everybody. If, if you take pleasure from hitting a ball in a certain way, Surely we could make that little bit of <laughs> that little bit of fun accessible to everybody, and not go no. If you're from that background, you can't do it. You've got to play on a tennis court in a in a park that's concrete with a big pothole in it and a gate with a that you could just about squeeze open with a big sign on saying if you can't pay, you won't play, and a fucking ferocious dog attacks you. <laughs> <laughs> And a net that like, bends down till it's about three inches from the ground in the middle. You know, that sort of thing. It's also a sport that has a hugely strong lure for nerds. I mean, the people who listen to this program call themselves the final nerds. There's a, a great deal of self-identification in being the kind of nerd who gets into the cricket stats books and so on, like we do on our programs. And there's a consistency there. I remember listening to the Mark Steele lectures years and years ago and, and, and feeling so happy because he was someone who was making jokes about Napoleon's campaigns into Russia and you know, <laughs> things, that, things that nerds get excited about. Is, but is a lot of your life just having nerds come up to you and being vaguely grateful that you kind of get what they think is funny? I've never really thought of it like that. I mean, maybe. Maybe it's sort of... Um, maybe it's a nerdy thing. I don't know. I mean, maybe it is a little bit... You know, OCD. Can you say that these days? I don't know. Maybe it is. Cricket is a bit, isn't it? I mean, there there is... I know every sport's got its statistics, but I think if you're an absolute statistics obsessive, then cricket will really, really uh, keep you busy. Um, and they will love it. The people who sit at county games with the score, that's... I think they do need a little bit of assistance. <laughs> Might be if you're listening right now. Provide them some assistance. Provide them with a solution. The, the, the Mark still solution. Well, I suppose it's, a, it's harmless. I suppose, you know, if you took away their scorebook yes. so that they weren't marking every single ball down, maybe they'd end up chopping people up and putting them in their fridge. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so it's probably providing a service. I go down to... Um, God, it seems amazing now as we're in the autumn, but it was, must have only been 10 days or so ago, the last week of the season. And I, I go down to Canterbury uh, once a year. I, I make that is a pilgrimage, and it is the right place for a pilgrimage. I, uh, I went there as a kid uh, a lot. And I think that probably helped, actually, because I, I, I was a Kent fan, um, being brought up in Kent. And my dad, uh, probably the best memories I have, really, with me, 
with, with my dad. I was never particularly close to my parents, but but that was brilliant. They, they, he was great at that. He would take us to Maidstone and Canterbury and Tunbridge Wells and Folkestone, and we would watch Kent and watch several games a season. And Kent had a really, really, really brilliant and a lovely side that you could identify. And I could be boring, but I could reel off the players, but the ones that people have heard of, Colin Cowdery and Asif Iqbal and uh, Alan Knott and Derek Underwood. Uh, and uh, yes, I'll I'll stop there. But the, but all I knew, I you know, I'd, all, uh, all the players, I just thought you know, I'd loved them. And Kent won quite a number of tournaments and stuff at that time, and that probably that probably helped. And uh, now here's a thing. So my lad, when he was about seven, I went down there with him, and he said, "Will we be able to play when we go down today?" And I, I said, "Well, you know." Yeah, a little bit. You can go out on the outfield and have a little, have a game with a tennis ball during the lunch break and mm. the tea break and that. And he went, all right. So we got down there and there was a tea hut. It's gone now. There was a tea hut just on the on the boundary. And he, he had his bat and he said, can you bowl at me? I said, all right. So he was sort of up against the wall of this tea hut and, I, and he just kept and he batted and batted and I was keeping one eye on the game right through to the lunch interval. During the lunch break, we went on the outfield all afternoon, bowl it all afternoon, all through the tea break, carried on after the tea break. And then at about five or something, I said, right, I want to sit and watch this now. And he sat next to me and he cries, it's not fair. I want to play. And I went, we've been playing all day. <laughs> and he went, bowl at me. And I went, no, we're going to just watch, just watch, just watch. Just for the last hour, we're going to watch. It's not fair. And the bloke in front, right, just, like a magical thing to happen if you're a parent. A bloke in front turned round and he said to me, son, he said, I've been watching your dad. He's been bowling at you all day. You know, give him a break and just watch this now. And I thought, wow, thanks, mate. And I looked up and it was Derek Underwood. <laughs> <laughs> and I... 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 Mr. Un- thank you, Mr. Underwood. Thank you, Mr. Underwood. And he went, well, you know, obviously you've been bowling out all day. I said, I hope you don't mind me saying, but I just, was, I remember you to come and you, but with Alan Knott and this, but and all the matches that used to bowl spin. Do you remember you used to bowl spin? He said, yes, yes, I did bowl. Yeah, I thought, uh, uh, I was so pathetically starstruck. And I, I was just used to, always, when I was a kid, used to, with Alan Knott, Yes, well, thank you anyway. Thank you. Well, enjoy the game. And I I was absolute reduced to an absolute gibbering wreck. But you'd have people that would do that to you, right? Like, you know, there's that expression, never meet your heroes. And a couple oh, of people, like, and a couple of people I've met in... Oh, no, I'll, 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 I'll just <laughs> build on that. But what I mean is that um, you, often when you meet people who you admire in sport, creative arts, whatever, they can let you down. Uh, I've had that experience. But you've had a bloody good one there with... Um, with uh, with Derek Underwood, like there'd be people who would admire your work greatly, given you've been prominent on the television, performing on radio. You know, you've been so prominent on as a public figure for such a long time. People would come up to you, and yeah, you, you would, I suppose, feel some obligation to be uh, give them a good experience I when they yeah, meet you. Sometimes people come up and they go, "Oh, I'm so yeah," and you sort of think, "Oh, don't be daft," but maybe that's what he thought. But I find sports people, I think, are more humble than comics. I mean, in a comic, your whole your your whole red on debtor, if you like, is I want a big audience. Right. That. Whereas I think a cricketer, most cricketers probably they're not that bothered, are they? They uh, most cricketers just want they're they're trying to bowl the bloke out. Well, they're trying they're trying hit. to be excellent as often as they can. Yeah. There is some similarities there, I suppose, with like. You know, we, we've had entertainers on the program before who talk about touring, and there's that there's that comparison. The cricketers who tour a lot, and every day they go out and try yeah. and perform, and in their way, it's their art, right? And they they go out and try and be the best they can be. I mean, that's kind of you know, I don't know how many nights a year you're performing these days, but like many nights a year, you're on stage and they're paying their hard earned to, yeah, to yeah, see yeah. you do your thing. It is analogous. Yes, it is. I think that I have enormous admiration for them uh, uh, there. Yeah. Because they, um, 
that must be so hard. And when you sometimes get people, won't you, who go, they're paid all that money, I'd bloody I'd wear the shirt for nothing, all that <laughs> rubbish that people go. And I think, yeah, but <laughs> we're all human. And I would think if you're out in Australia for eight weeks for an Ashes series and you've lost at Brisbane and it's your, you're not getting on with this person and that person, I feel for the players who've been in that situation, like on the one where Swan come home and trot come home and all that I thought god that must be terrible that must be so horrible when it's in the papers and uh, that, that you're useless and uh, uh, it must be so so difficult and you've not seen your kids and you go I, I, no I really really I do really really feel for them I think that must be must be all good and they didn't ask for this prominence they didn't ask for that acclamation I think if you're if you're in entertainment you have asked for that in a way mm-hmm. and so if you get a bad review or whatever Graham Fowler I got sort of a, a bit matey with partly because of our mutual friend um, Dan when he was doing his uh, test match sofa thing yep. and Graham Fowler used to go on with it go go on that and um, uh and yeah, he he sort of amazed me really with that. He, I remember he told me this story about our when he was a young lad. Well, God, he was he was not that young lad. He was playing for England, and it was one of his first matches. And uh, he ever told you this? And his helmet got a bit tangled, so he took his helmet off, but he didn't have time to get it back on before the next ball. And whoever was up the other end called for a run, and he ran, but was slightly higgledy piggledy because his helmet was sort of in this end and that and he was just an inch short and he was run out and apparently on the commentary uh Richie Benno said if he'd had his helmet on he'd have got in and he said he felt terrible I don't know what age he'd have been mid-20s I guess and he said the, the following week he was uh in a record shop he's a big record collector in Manchester and he said and this bloke just came up, random bloke come up right behind him and just in a Richie Benno voice just went, if he'd had his helmet on, he'd have got in. <laughs> and Fowler said, I, it absolutely got to me. And I went home, he said, I didn't come out the house for two days. I just couldn't go out. I thought they're all, that's what the whole world's thinking. God, and I thought, that must be hard. I mean, I know what, it's hard enough when you're a comic and you're that's your thing is to be mm. out there provoking mm. people and so on. And so and people write rude things about you, but all you've wanted to do is hit a ball. <laughs> and now you're in a record shop and a random person is like coming up and calling you an arsehole, basically. I really felt Joe, here's another thing. This is how good they are. First time I met Graham Fowler. We went downstairs for a pint after we'd finished at the end of the day's play that we've been commentating on. And we were talking about, and I've, I've done this. I don't know if you've had this, Adam, but I, I've done this. When you're talking to sports, I'm talking to a cricketer. Alex Stewart did this to me once. I was talking about you know, batting in my team and stuff. And then the next time I saw him, he was criticising something that Kevin Peterson had done. And he went, that was idiotic what he did there. And he went, you'd know that as a batsman. And I went, no, I'm not a batsman like you're a batsman. I play for a team where the highlight of the day is the umpire gets a ball in his shin and his ex-wife won't put any ice on his leg. I've not got how many ever centuries. And so, but, and so I'm talking about batting with, with Graham Foxy Fowler. And at one point he said, "Mark, I hope you don't mind me seeing, but I think one thing that uh, one thing that you can do is, uh, I think when you go forward, you go a little bit too far. You go a bit too far, and you get a little bit off balance. You're going to get ball behind your legs, or maybe LBW on your back leg, something like that." I said, "Yeah, that, yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah." So just, you know, maybe you could do a little exercise in the nets or something. Put a little cone down. And then you, as you go forward, you don't just do, you don't go so far. I said, how did you know that? And he went, well, I can tell from the way you're sitting. <laughs> <laughs> what witchcraft is that? <laughs> well, he enjoys that, doesn't he, Foxy? He's got the... Uh this, Jeff, is it the, it's the kinetic, isn't it? With the, with the bandana and his theory about 
um, we've done this with Daniel before. Jeff will explain it better than I will. But where, um, where if you um, is it rubber chip packet on your head, Jeff? Pick it up. Pick up the story. Oh yes, yes. What is it? Plastic. If if you've got any plastic making contact with the top of your head, then your muscles are weaker. And so he'll demonstrate this by putting a plastic packet on your head and then you can no longer hold your arm up if he tries to push it down. But if he takes the plastic packet off your head, you can resist the push. And it's, I mean, we've done this enough times we've done it to with know him. it's not bullshit. And which is why he had his cricketers when Fox, who was running the academy, they would wear bandanas underneath their, uh, between their head and their helmet in order to provide some barrier between the plastic touching their head to give them stronger arms or something like that. <laughs> so I've seen Daniel do it with a cigarette lighter before. So much, and it works. It, I, mean, it, I mean, it's ridiculous. But What other mad things are there that we've not found? <laughs> if you put a goldfish in each sock, you just play the cover drive. You time it perfectly. Maybe in 50 years, people will be, like, there'll be commentators going, well, of course, that was back in the days before people would have put goldfish in the sock. <laughs> Unbelievable, isn't it? What, what, yeah, again, it's, a, it's, an yeah, extraordinary, yeah. it's an extraordinary sport in many respects. <laughs> <laughs> the, recent, the recent one of those was the uh, if you put a wire coat hanger over your head, then your head automatically turns 90 degrees to the left and you can't stop it doing it. This is a thing on the internet that's also true. <laughs> that'll be brought in. That, that, that'll be brought in if, it's, um, if there's too many runs in cricket. There'll be a sort of certain things. Well, one thing that the ECB are looking at is the sort of wire coat hanger effect. And uh, that uh, every one ball and over, they have to play with a wire coat hanger over their head. And that's uh, they'll just give the bowlers a bit more of a chance. Oh, there'll be a thing that in 2020, there'll be a, some sort of triangle thing the captain can make. Oh, and he's going for the coat hanger. So for this <laughs> over, they have to bat with a wire coat hanger over their head. Uh, I wanted to just change direction quickly to your uh, to your uh, your work. So it was interesting. I, I felt like I'm I'm often in, living in England, but being from Australia, I'm interested in the differences between the culture. And you know, you pick up on stuff, I suppose, more when you've lived in both. One is that when there's a massive event like the Queen passing away, you're in high demand. Like satirists in the UK around then, it was like people were sourcing you. People wanted to know what you guys thought and your your right. take on these matters. Like comedians were front and center of that, even though it was a a time of you know, national mourning and a somber um, dynamic, but people wanted to hear how you would take, how, what your take would be, your, what your perspective would be. And I guess the same applies with the proliferation of comics in newspapers writing columns or on panel shows, even up to like question time and whatever else. Yeah, you just yeah. wouldn't get that in Australia, but there's a, you know, you've been able to dance between like being a cultural analyst and a stand-up comedian and making documentaries. Like there, there seems to be a lot of breadth for you in addition to going out and playing cricket on a Sunday. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've never really thought of myself as a satirist, really. I don't, I sort of, I think I'm a comic and I think uh, if something seems funny, that's the thing. I thought I'd be doing a bit, of, uh, right. So this is a bit I've been doing the last couple of weeks. Uh, and I, I don't know what the if this is interesting or not, but about the Queen. So I did this probably three days after she died. It was the first show that I did, and it was a well, it was quite a big theatre and stuff. So it wouldn't have all been people on the left or anarchistic people or anything. But I did a, the sort of thing that went well was I said, "Poor Hugh Edwards." That got a laugh. I was really interested. <laughs> Poor Hugh Edwards. So Hugh Edwards, for people who don't know, uh, he is this sort of um, guy who's been doing the news here for about 20 years. He's the main news reader. And uh, if there's an event such as the Queen passing, then he's the bloke who has to sit there and do all of the, the commentary. And I went, poor Hugh Edwards, got a laugh. And I just started improvising the sort of thing he'd been doing. Well, now... We're looking at the leaves outside of Buckingham Palace, and there they are. How sad they look. They've been told the news, as is etiquette in these circumstances, by the twigs and the branches who have told them about the passing of Her Majesty. And there goes one of them blowing in the wind now, down Palma, looking a little brown, no doubt sad, but also hopeful as he prepares for life as a leaf under King Charles the Third, And this got a big cheer. I'm sure it did, yes. And I thought, I thought, now, when I thought about it, I thought, I suppose you could be a monarchist and you would still find that 
funny, really. I would, I would think. I did. I th- and I did a character of a bloke going, um, the sort of bloke that they had on on the news all the time. Uh, I can't remember what I called him now, Lieutenant Colonel Chisler's Marzipan or something. Well, my personal memories of the Queen, extraordinary. I mean, many people won't know know about this, but uh, uh, but I mean, uh, uh, do you know that Her Majesty was an absolutely marvellous jazz drummer? <laughs> Quite extraordinary. I mean, I kind of go. We was uh, she accompanied me once to Ronnie Scott's and uh, a wonderful jazz club there in Soho, and uh, there was a quartet that she was particularly keen on. And it was announced that the drummer couldn't uh, couldn't continue. I think he'd taken rather too much heroin or some such. And do you know? Do you know Her Majesty? She just got up and she said, "I'll take over," and she saw it as a civic duty, and she didn't miss a beat all night. She was absolutely syncopated everything. Quite wonderful! What a remarkable woman she was, or oh, something like that. <laughs> and, and this sort of character guy, I ended up doing it much longer than that. And yeah. I think I had her doing a Paso Doble and Strictly Come Dancing and stuff. And she was sort of, um, and it, I thought afterwards, I thought, oh, that was interesting because it, it was. I think if you just went out there and went, yeah, fucking queen, bollocks to them all. I think that would people would just think, oh mate, you know. I think the sort of um. There's something about finding where people are and finding finding what people find funny about it, really. I don't know. I suppose a satirist... To me, a satirist is, sounds like it's a bit too elite, really. I think I'm... It, it's a... It's a, it sounds like someone who's sort of going to gently poke fun at the flaws and inadequacies of the Liberal Democratic proposed policy on roads and highways whereas I think I think if if you can't do something that you reckon would go well in a pub in a random pub I think don't that's probably a failing on my part. You know, do you but. think that's why in town works? Like where you go somewhere, and often, I mean, I know, I know it's not always this way, but I listened to your in town on on Newport last week. I've actually been watching the, the Wrexham documentary about right. uh, Ryan Reynolds and uh, you know and, and the takeover of uh, of that football club in in North Wales. But you know, Newport, working class town yeah. in South Wales, and and you kind of rip shit out of it in a lovely gentle way for the most part but rip shit out of it all the same do you think that like you are given latitude because people don't think you're being an elitist when you're doing it yeah probably I mean it's nice of you to say so it was uh, well the Newport for people who don't know most people won't know Newport is a very industrial town in South Wales and I and I did I the the, the, the lines that I'm most pleased of with this show, because the idea of the show, for people who don't know, I go to a town and I find out as much as I can about it and I write about an hour's show about that town and perform it in front of people in the town. And the ruder I am about it, the better it seems to go. <laughs> and when I've got a line that I think I can't do that, and with me producer, Carl, we sort of go, oh, God, that is a bit much, isn't it? I don't know. That's that's when you you have to go no do it that will go so with Newport I think one of the first lines was you've done something amazing here Newport because this was a town that was full of mines and docks and grime and squalor and now all the mines and docks have gone but somehow the grime and squalor are still here I don't know how you've managed that and, <laughs> and I thought I can't start with that they'll go the oh, fuck you want a bolt and I, but they just cheered and I thought oh we're all right here they were at they were just so so lovely they've got a and it's in a green accent they've got a new part it's really distinct it's, not, it's, it's like it's different from anywhere else because it's got a little bit of Bristol and they call people clart all right clart i sees you up the park on the draw you noser which i got i got taught the accent by goldie looking chain who these sort of joke uh brilliant brilliant uh hip-hop band but they very jokey as well uh yeah and they were uh, yeah i think so i think that you want to be you want to kind of like people mm. you've got to sort of go oh people here are brilliant they're really funny and enthusiastic about their town and they and you, you've got to like them. I mean, I, the left don't seem to like anybody half the time. You know, they've ever, they can't, don't like this person because of that view or that or that, something. I think, why do you want to liberate humanity, mate? You seem to hate most of them. I don't know. And um, 
I don't think that. And I think that I think in most places, most people you come across are brilliantly imaginative and funny and enthusiastic. And I suppose, but I don't. You know, I don't know. That might go to why you had a slightly more. Uh, open-minded attitude towards the Queen's funeral and say, Daniel, I know you and Daniel did a What the Fuck's Going oh, On podcast. he was very podcast. funny. I mean, he's he was... extremely good. I love Daniel's bit on the funeral. Needless yeah, to say, yeah. I've heard it a few times. Uh, but you you had a more sort of, uh, I was going to say warm approach. Like you, you, you saw the funeral as something that was, uh, that, that had inherent merit about the British people, whereas Daniel was, uh, <laughs> Daniel was, uh, was, uh, was less forgiving perhaps. Um. Yeah, maybe. I don't think I disagree with Daniel. But I mean, I think the funeral was amazing. Yeah. But I think it was also amazing for a reason, which is like, this is what we are and we c- will carry on doing this. This stays forever. Don't think you change this. I think there was an ele- there's a big element of that to it. Uh, and that's, you know, this is what we did. When we arrived in India, we did this sort of thing. Mm. We stay forever. I think there's a very, very big thing. I think having said that, there was brilliant. I mean, the choirs and stuff were amazing. Uh, you know, incredible. But uh, yeah, Daniel was very funny about it because he said his wife, Catherine, who'd been a dance teacher, was going, they're out of step. <laughs> <laughs> Between that and not believing she was in the coffin, it was... Yeah. Oh, yeah, he didn't believe she was in the coffin. He convinced me, though. I was. I thought, no, I suppose you're right. Hard to dispute him when he gets on a roll. The, uh, the Mark Steele lectures that you did were about people you found interesting. No surprises that one of the first ones was W.G. Grace, someone we have a complicated relationship on this show. What's your uh, favourite bit of W.G. gear? Oh, I when I did the WG Grace program on the radio, one of the things I uh, I got a book from this second-hand bookshop in Epsom, I think, uh, and it was WG Grace's Cricket Tips, and there were ten cricket tips right at the start for a young man that wishes to take up the art of batting, and number seven was do not go out to bat while smoking a pipe. <laughs> Bless him. <laughs> Speaks volumes. I love the fact that Grace is still featured up on your wall, by the way. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the very lovely Mike Marcus, you got rest his soul, gave me that once for a birthday present, that picture, uh, who wrote a, uh, a wonderful bloke who wrote a book called Anyone But England, which is a, uh, a sort of social history of, of cricket, if you like. Um, it's funny, you know, all, all of these projects you're involved in, uh, you know, kind of at the same time mentioned, you know, you're still writing columns, you know, you got a lot on your plate, right? Then COVID comes around and obviously none of us had much doing, unless we created our own work as Jeff and I did and Daniel and I did. You know, in the creative arts, there was no more work in the short term. Yeah. The way that you were able to, I guess, refocus a lot of that. I remember seeing you one afternoon in, in Daniel's garden. Yeah. Um, you know. Uh, in it, fact, we were drinking some rum and I'm just going to get a little bit more. Why don't you do that while I continue yeah. asking the question? That sounds like a good idea. Uh, which, you know, I, I know in... in um, in making that Calling the Shots documentary with Daniel, we spoke a lot about Test Match Chauffeur uh, and about how um, he was able to dig deep into his um, uh, connections and uh, all the friends he made along the way. And you were part of that, of course, becoming a, a cricket commentator. I, I wonder uh, how that um, how that experience of going behind the mic and being a cricket commentator, albeit in Daniel's living room, uh, how that, I guess, changed your appreciation for what it was and and uh, and how that friendship's remained clearly strong to this day. I think uh, all of what you do is is uh, it's an amazing thing. I mean, cricket being a cricket commentator is slightly uh, different from commentating on any other sport. Obviously, everyone is uh, all the sports are unique, but cricket does afford because it because of the time. It does afford a sort of a, a chatty approach. In fact, you have to have a chatty approach. So mm. I get re- right. Oh, this drives me nuts. Tennis commentators in this country. This is oh, the BBC have these tennis commentators. They're clearly brilliant at one level, uh, but but they'll go. This is what they'll do, right? So it'll be th- three all in the fifth set. 
Uh, and so Nadal now serving at three all in the fifth set. And with us is um, uh, is a person that you probably won't have heard of who's acted in a couple of things. Do you often come to Wimbledon? And in the background <laughs> you can hear... Boom, and then you can hear the, you can hear the the score, but you can't. You can hear someone saying the score, but you can't. What it is? Uh, uh, uh. What's the score? Who won that point? Well, uh, do you go to? Where do you eat round here? Well, I do. There's a wonderful curry house that I often go to. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Marvelous, isn't it? And do you, when you're acting, do you do you uh, do you often do you keep a, do you get a chance to keep a, keep a, uh, um, keep an eye on something like Wimbledon? Well, of course, it was wonderful, and it, uh, we're going to be doing a new series of it. And they go for fucking ages without saying the score. I've literally, I've been driving along in my car. <laughs> I've literally been going, what's the fucking score? I've been ready to ring the bloody BBC thing. The, the, the complaints line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You go, can you tell them? I just keep, I'm fascinated by the fact that they bloody keep llamas. But can you fucking... <laughs> if they've got a moment to just tell us the score... I know, I, I'm sure there have been Wimbledons where they've whole things gone. Oh, well, that's the end of Wimbledon for this year and they've not told you who's won. I, it's and fucking when they do, criminal. And when they do tell you who's won, this is a gripe of mine with tennis commentators, using the first names all the time, yeah, it's too yeah, familiar. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, Roger this, yeah, yeah, Rafa yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. No other sport do we... It's like, it's, no. not, it's not treating them like infants, but there is a sense yeah, yeah. of... Uh, um, it, 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 it's too familiar. It, it takes away the objectivity that... If you are narrating the sport, you are yes. in theory at least meant to have. Yes, I agree. I know your mates. I know that sort of Roger and Rafa do have that Roger and Rafa quality, but uh, I but suppose Jimmy, that. Jimmy Anderson. But, but I, you I wouldn't think go. You still refer to Anderson. I mean, you know, if I were commentating on Jimmy in a Test match, I would refer to him as Anderson. I wouldn't say Jimmy this, Jimmy that. I don't think in cricket <laughs> we give ourselves that like. I think we don't. What, Shane. I like to think we're not as indulgent would as you that. Done it with Shane. With Warren. Mm. Uh, I don't, well, again, I didn't commentate, I suppose, in his era, but I reckon that as a rule, look, that might set apart commentators who are clearly trying to be objective against those who quite um, lean into the matey stuff. But, you know, if, if, if it were on Test Match Special, it'd be Anderson, despite the fact that Anderson is Jimmy Anderson, the commentator on one day cricket for them. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is that point of difference. But yeah, like the, the, the sofa community that you're part of, that was that's a pretty special thing. Like we made an entire episode devoted to the disruptors in that in the in that um in that doco and jeff was part of that um with um with uh, myself making i guess the test match show for equivalent in melbourne a little bit after that which was our gateway to it but a lot of you guys that came through there guys and girls there was lots of different types of people who um committed to sitting on a sofa through the night getting pissed talking about the cricket doing it your way for some it proved to be the entry point to working in cricket for others i suppose it scratched an itch I mean, where, yeah, did, where yeah. is that? I, I suppose it was more the latter for you, but talk us through your sofa experience. Well, I, um, I can't remember exactly how it happened, but I think Dan got in touch with me. Dan Norcross got in touch with me and said, we're doing this sort of test match commentary thing where we do it from my sofa. And he was living in Tooting. And yeah. was, I sort of cycled around there. Crystal Palace from Tooting is not a particularly arduous uh, uh, bike ride. And uh, I went into his living room and there was this sort of like massive... Massive setup of all like wires and a mixing desk and everything and all the stuff going in and out of various like sockets. And then you could have said anything except a massive pile of drugs and it still would have worked. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it was so and it was brilliant because you could be sort of irreverent and I think sure, I did yeah. you know bits in you know I think I probably did various uh, impre the first impression I ever did when I was a kid I don't know how but I was about ten maybe my voice had dropped earlier and I was able to do. John Harlot, who <laughs> some people remember. Who, and I remember I used to do that when I was a kid because I used to listen to the cricket commentary a lot. And so I think I used to do, yeah, I used to do a sort of uh, druggy John Harlot. And the, I think I've heard you do that when you asked in the past. <laughs> yeah, the trouble is I'm struggling at the moment to see the ball because it's normally around the time that I start on the skunk and it's <laughs> 10 minutes after the lunch interval and my dealer doesn't seem to have arrived. <laughs> Something like that, I don't know. But, England uh, are 42 anyway, for two. <laughs> no down on the offside, there's no run and England are still 109 for two. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so we did, yeah, that sort of thing. and Because um, it really was like that, That, and I should say, by the way, Jeff's had to leave us, he's gone to the airport, if you're wondering why it's just me now. Um, 
the you know the, I think Jared Kimber uh, it has described it well in the past. Like it, it he he said. All the fucked up weird people were all in the same place at the same time from cricket land, <laughs> and that's why it had its magic to it. And, you know, it, it's it's a it's a special legacy because Sofa has produced a number of people who've gone on to have you know like grown up cricket jobs, but many of whom are still perfectly happy doing what they were doing back in '09 when Sofa started in its first incarnation. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Well, I suppose it is like anything else. There's something beautiful about just doing something, and it doesn't have to be. Uh, that this is this is a step towards be, be, being a big star. Yeah. And that's the same in anything. You know, there is something glorious about being in a band and playing at the local pub and sure. everybody's dancing. And that doesn't mean, oh, right, yeah, so I suppose you're hoping one day to be uh, to pl- be playing 50,000-seat stadiums. Uh, no, not, not necessarily, no. And um, I hope comedy gets like that because there's so many people want to be comics and I think, oh, you did really enjoy this if you saw it as a, if you saw it as in the same way that amateur sports people do. You know? mm. But so many people, they're doing five minutes of comedy and then they're try and they think that they can be professional at it. And I think you don't want to be, you don't know how bloody, how hard it is. You don't want to be doing that. Just do this twice a month and enjoy this. In the same way, you know, there are, a million people playing sport every week who just want to win their match and be as good as they can in their match. They're not thinking, most of the people in the park aren't thinking, oh, if I score twice today against this pub team, <laughs> I'll be picked up by Arsenal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that's a, uh, a nice theme to leave it on, that uh, you do it because you love it and obviously you, you take enormous amount of satisfaction out of your professional work but also still loving the game the way you did when you were a kid 